Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for coming along today and joining us for the fourth in our series of our Get Rare Aware online webinars. The point of the Get Rare Aware campaign is to try and ensure that everybody understands the challenges facing people living with rare diseases, that they are rare aware, and to ask for more resources for our genetic services. Um, the main centre for genetic services in the country is based out of Crumlin Children's Hospital. And uh, they are struggling, I guess, to keep up with their peers in other uh, countries in terms of resources available to them. And as a result, the waiting lists are terribly long for, for people living with rare diseases going through Crumlin genetics. Typically, somebody might be waiting for up to two years to get a, a diagnosis through Crumlin genetics. And when we look north of the border up to Belfast, they're waiting about three months. So clearly there's a lot can be done. So why, why are we... I guess, doing this, well, really, a diagnosis is so important. It sets you on the path to ensure that you're getting the correct treatment for your condition. You have a known condition then, and you can be treated appropriately for that condition. At the moment, people are waiting, uh, about 37% of people are waiting over five years for a diagnosis. And during that time period, they will see multiple different consultants and potentially be treated for conditions that they don't actually have. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that people get an opportunity to get into genetics as quickly as possible and to get that diagnosis. With a diagnosis, as I say, you get onto the right type of treatment. You can also maybe find other people living with the condition and you can uh, seek support from patient organisations and from others living with the conditions and get a little bit of a better understanding as to what, what the future might hold. For many people, a diagnosis is the first answer or the answers the first question that they may have in terms of, um, uh, you know, what, what to do and where to go. So today I'm joined by uh, Dr. Jim O'Byrne, um, who I will refer to as Jim, who's a consultant metabolic clinician in the Matter Hospital, and by Sarah Nolan, who's the mother to Anya. Um, Jim, I might just start with you and uh, maybe why is a diagnosis so important? What's what, what's the importance of this? What do you feel? Uh, thanks, Vicky, and thanks for, for inviting uh, me to uh, share uh, our experience today here. Um, so, so first of all, uh, I'm, I'm based in the Matter Hospital. I'm in based in the National Centre of Inherited Metabolic Disorders in the Matter Hospital. And um, we have a group of patients attending our service here. Uh, currently, 1,200 patients attend our service here. Uh, about 50% of our patients have received a diagnosis in the, in, during pediatric years, and about 50% are diagnosed in adulthood as well. So um, the first point I wanted to bring out, I suppose, is that the diagnoses are being made now. It's not just in the pediatric setting. It's right throughout um, the life cycle. And uh, recently diagnosed somebody in their 60s um, with an accurate genetic diagnosis that he managed right throughout his life. Uh, but it's, it is crucial, of course, because, well, one, it's, it's, it, it's, it's good to know. Um, it's, it's good. The relief I sometimes see on patients' faces uh, when a diagnosis is secured, oftentimes after many years of, of touring different uh, um, uh, services, uh, you know, is 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 something that is a frequent thing that we see in clinic. Um, there is that 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 finally people understand why uh, these issues have been there with the patient. So there's there's that. Second, obviously, it puts you on a very sure footing for medical uh, management. Uh, now, medical management can take the form of treatments like specific treatments, many of which that are coming through now are gene or genotype specific treatments. So to become a candidate for these treatments, oftentimes you have to know the gene or the gene change that um, is actually present. Uh, second uh, type of therapy is, of course, clinical trials. So there may not be an established uh, licensed treatment, but perhaps now there is a clinical trial maybe not in Ireland, but in another European country or beyond, that now this patient could be actually um, enrolled. Um, and then in terms of the family, um, all of the patients with a genetic diagnosis, uh, really, they're, they're, oftentimes we, we roll out testing to other family members, identifying family members who are at risk, um, also identifying family members who are not at risk, 
um, which can also be a very powerful piece of information uh, to take through. So there's, there's multiple reasons really uh, to, to, to why the importance of a diagnosis is important. And it's really, it's the patient and the wider family as well. Thank, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, just before I go any uh, further, just to let people know that there should be a Q&A function. If anybody has any questions, please do submit them through the Q&A function. And maybe also you could take the opportunity to introduce yourselves to, to the other people that are on the call, um, uh, where, where, where you're living maybe and uh, what, what, why you're here. Um, Sarah, you have obviously, um, you know the value of a diagnosis. Onya's story is absolutely amazing. And to think that yesterday she celebrated her third birthday, herself and her twin Katie. Um, so uh, I, I guess maybe do you want to tell us a little bit a little bit about Onya and uh, her diagnosis of infantile autosomal osteopetrosis? I think I've got that right. <laughs> I still got it wrong and I'm dealing with it the last two years, Vicky, so it's absolutely no problem. Um, so we had twins in the middle of lockdown, <clears throat> in the middle of the first lockdown in 2020. And we always kind of knew that Anya was a bit smaller than Katie and it was just like she was much harder to put on weight and stuff. So from four weeks old, we've been dealing with Temple Street and we were in and out. We actually had a um, she stayed for 10 days when she was five weeks old and the doctor we had did so many tests for us and there was always kind of different results coming back and stuff and she had low phosphate and low calcium and all these kind of things um, which meant absolutely nothing to me and then when we got out we were in and out as an outpatient for a few months and in the December so Anya would have been about seven months old they brought me in and they actually told me that she had hypophosphatic rickets, which was due to low phosphate at birth. And I accepted it. It was a diagnosis. I said, brilliant. We know what it is now. We can deal with it. This is great. And a month later, they um, asked us to come in for an x-ray and another appointment with our endocrinologist. And it was the 26th of January and I brought her in, we went and we got our x-ray and then we went down and we got a cup of tea and then we went up and we met our endocrinologist. And when, we, when she walked into the room, I knew there was something different about her. She was the same woman I'd met in the December who had diagnosed her with the um, hypophosphatic group. I just knew there was something different. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, you just seem very different today. Um, is, is there something wrong? And she said, yeah, listen, we thought your daughter had the hypophosphatic rickets and the x-ray shows we were wrong. That's not what she has. It is all like what she does have, which is the infantile uh, osteoporosis, is misdiagnosed as uh, hypophosphatic rickets a lot in a lot of cases because they present the exact same. And um, it's just more when they did the further investigations. So she said to me, listen, we think she might have something. The uh, radiologist consultant thinks we might have something here and we don't have six months to sit in the fence. I'm not convinced, but we do not have six months to sit in the fence. We need to test her for it. And I said, OK, what are we testing her for? And she said, I'm not telling you because I know you're going to go home and Google it. And Google's not going to help anybody. And I went, OK, so I thought this was a little bit weird. And she said, we don't actually even test for it in this country. Her tests have to go over to Bristol and they take six weeks. So I brought her down. I got her, uh, her blood test done. We sent it off to Bristol. I came home to my husband and I said, I have no idea what's going on, but we know there's something different than what they had told us back in December. He was like, OK, no problem. So we were kind of in this little limbo. They had no idea what was going on. And on the Friday, which was three days later, she rang us at six o'clock on a Friday evening and she said to us listen we can tell you there was one test Crumlin genetics could do and it showed that there was a change in her TCIRG1 gene um, which meant she has osteoporosis and I went okay no problem she said we can't tell you the form of it we can't tell you the severity of it we can't tell you how much it's taken over her little body but we can tell you she has this condition 
And I went, okay, so what do I do now? They said, we need to test her eyes. We need to test her hearing. Um, and we need to get the family tested to see if she is eligible for a bone marrow transplant, which is the only treatment for osteoporosis. It's not a cure, but it is the only treatment. Um, if she is eligible for the transplant, we need to see if any of the family are a match. So for the next six weeks, we sat in limbo and we got our eyes tested and they told us that due to thickening of the bones and the density of the bones in her skull, they had damaged the nerve at the back of her left eye. So she was almost blind in her left eye, but her right eye was always perfect. So we, we took that, we said, great. Her hearing was fine. And um, we got our blood tests done and then it was a waiting game. And in that six weeks, I did exactly what my endocrinologist told me that I wasn't to do. And I went on to Google and Dr. Google was not my friend in this situation. It was very, very scary. But one thing that I always took from it was if Anya hadn't been eligible for transplant, if her condition had taken over too much, she wouldn't have made her second birthday. And that was scary to me. But I'm the kind of person that has to go to the worst case scenario and then work backwards when I get good news. Whereas my husband, Stephen, stays at the start and works forward when we get news. So in my head for those couple of weeks, I was like, I have a year and a half left. My daughter's not going to make her second birthday. Um, and it was it's an awful thing to say now. And looking back, it was such a silly mind frame to be in because it didn't help anybody. But I got to a stage where I just had to stop Googling. I said, no, do you know what? Every time I went on to Google, I found something else scary. And I had to, if that was going to be the case, I had to live with Anya and I had to live in the moment with her and had to keep everything going for her, her twin Katie and our older two children, Jack and Freya. Um, so then on the 2nd of March, 2021, we got a phone call um, on a Tuesday evening at eight o'clock, which we knew wasn't going to be nice because who rings with good news at eight o'clock on a Tuesday. Um, but she told us that, yeah, Anya has infantile osteoporosis, but she's eligible for transplant, which was such a relief. I actually cannot even put it into words how relieved we were. Like it was horrible to be told, yes, your daughter has a rare condition that she's going to have to live with. But being told that there was treatment was just amazing. Um, we weren't, none of us were, sorry, none of our siblings were a match. So the next step was we had to go for a brain MRI um, because one of the big things in osteoporosis cases is hydrocephalus, which is excess fluid on the brain. So we went for, it was all very quick once we got our uh, diagnosis and it was like a very important diagnosis. It was, a, it was an urgent diagnosis for Anya. Um, but once we got our diagnosis, everything was so quick. We were in for MRI within a week. We had the results a week later does have hydrocephalus they told us the shunt had to be fitted that was that ball got rolling we met with our bone marrow team over in Crumlin um which was absolutely amazing um the whole actually all of the teams we've dealt with in this whole journey have been absolutely amazing um but they told us that so myself and my husband then got tested to see if we were a HLA match for Anya um, and it turned out we weren't. So then we had to go to a wider European pool and there was two matches in the world. Um, and when they looked into it, only one of them was actually still eligible to be a bone marrow donor. Um, so it was a lovely woman in Germany. We've never met her, but this absolute earth angel, as we call her, literally saved my daughter's life. So we went for transplant in July 2021 there was a lot of complications before we even got to transplant. Anya ended up in ICU with sepsis. We've had so many different infections and all this kind of thing. But we got there. We got our transplant in July 2021. She spent three and a half months in hospital. Um, that time, like three and a half months in a row. And we finally got out in October 2021. But it got to the stage where we said to, I said to our consultant, every time she came in to visit on you, I said, don't mention the word home. And she'd look at me. I said, don't mention the word home. Because anytime anyone mentioned the word home in front of Anya, 
she decided, oh no, I don't want to go home yet. Let's pick another infection to have or another <laughs> um, illness to get. So we actually got to a stage where she ended up with uh, hemolytic anemia and they told me she wouldn't be out of the hospital for at least four months. And I said, okay, at least I have a time frame. And that was the September, uh, that was the start of September. So I was expecting to like spend Christmas and New Year in Crumlin. And she miraculously, we still don't know how, fixed herself within four weeks. And we left Crumlin on the 13th of October. Um, she's now, she'll be two years post-transplant on the 8th of July. And she's just such beautiful little child and um, she was three yesterday which we never thought we'd get to like there's so many little things in life at the moment that I'm like oh I never thought I'd make it to here oh I never thought when we when we got this issue I never thought I never thought we'd do this so that's why I'm here today and um, helping people to get more rare aware and uh, because even when we were in hospital I was nearly I felt there was some staff, there was some medical professionals I was coming across on our journey and I was explaining to them what was wrong with my daughter and what the diagnosis was and where we had to go with the diagnosis, um, which was difficult as a mother, but I just had to be an advocate for Anya and all osteoporosis cases in the future. Um, yes, that may come out of the Thank, Thanks very much, Sarah. So I... Uh, 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 Jim, I'm I'm guessing you see this with some of your patients, maybe maybe not going for bone marrow transplants following following a diagnosis. But um, you mentioned there about accessing trials. Have you been able to send many of your patients into trials to get you know I guess access to those cutting edge treatments? How does that how does that work for you? Uh, thanks, Vicky. Yeah, so it, it it works fairly well, I would say. Um, but there, um, from the point of of identifying a patient and then identifying a trial to actually getting the patient uh, properly set in, can take some time. And um, and and uh, it, it, yeah, there's different challenges, I suppose, depending on 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 where the trial is. Yeah. Um, and you know how the different structures that are around to bring patients over, but we, yeah, we have on numerous occasions uh, enrolled patients in uh, trials in in European um, countries or 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 sent them. You know, and I think um, you know I think we mentioned briefly the European reference networks. I think you know that's going to be a significant uh, game changer in this. I hope it, it should really. Um, help significantly uh, for the movement of of uh, such such patients to such trials. I would hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, trials are. Yeah, I mean, like you only become eligible for trials. I mean, you'll fit, I guess, some general criteria. But for most of them, it's also that genetic piece of information that without it, you you may not get access to those trials at all. Yeah, it's usually an inclusion criteria, and yeah. um, and you know the. The, the way trials are set up now, they're usually very um, specific around inclusion and exclusion criteria, and there's good reason for that, of course. So, uh, yes, a genetic diagnosis, um, you know, and confirmed on the gene, let's say, is usually um, a crucial um, inclusion uh, criteria piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you find, I'm like, sometimes you might hear the, well, there's no point in getting a genetic diagnosis. It's not going to change how I care for the patient. Um, and, and people are are hearing this and kind of like, oh, well, you know, are, are you, you're seeking a genetic diagnosis proactively for your patients in case something comes up that they might be eligible for in five years time even? Uh, absolutely. I think in yeah. 2023, um, you know, if you suspect there is a genetic basis for the the the, the constellation of of symptoms and signs the patient has in front of you, you really have to go after it, because um, not only uh, does it potentially open up treatments and trials. Um, we discussed, you know, there are identifying other at risk family members who possibly yeah. haven't developed symptoms yet, but um, you know could be tested and maybe uh, intervention started 
um, prior to that. And then, of course, there's the, 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 the idea of family planning as well. So we here, we're very fortunate now. We've a genetic counsellor on board here um, uh, very recently. And um, uh, all of our patients that attend the unit here have a genetic diagnosis. And they now can receive uh, counselling um, in a timely manner. Um, and that's very important for a lot of reasons, including including family planning as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, Sarah, for 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 um, for uh, Onya's diagnosis, sorry, uh, for Onya's diagnosis, did you have to go out and share that information then with family members to see, you know, did did did, did your extended family have to get um, tested as well? Or or was this just a, a de novo kind of like a brand new thing that just happened by by bad luck? So um, it actually turns out that both myself and my husband are carriers of this condition. Um, and if I had met anybody else in the world or he had met anybody else, none of our kids may have ever had this. There's a 25% chance that our kids would. And we have four kids. So on it is our 25% chance. Um, I didn't have to get the other children tested because none of them were showing signs and especially our older kids if they had had it I know this is an awful way to put it um but if they had it we wouldn't they wouldn't still be here if they had gone undiagnosed so um I can't remember if they tested Katie but she wasn't showing any signs anyway um and like that we don't know how far back it goes then. Um, and like Jim said, for family planning and stuff, I was always kind of sure that four was my number and we were done. But this has been the final nail in the coffin. Because if we ever went to have any more children, there'd be a much higher chance that they would also have it because we've had a child with it. And I couldn't go through that again. Um, yeah. To be perfectly honest, I just, it, it was so difficult. Um, on all our family, on all our kids. And um, it, it was a very, very hard journey on all our extended family, on our friends, on everyone that got us through that journey. Um, so no, in our case, no one else has had to be tested, but it definitely has affected um, any future family planning issues that we <laughs> may or may not have considered. Yes. Yeah. 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 You have. You had. You have four children. It might be enough for some. You know. You never know. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's 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 kind of interesting. Um. And so I, I guess you know we 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 see information, uh, Jim, around you know I guess people being treated with for the wrong things, and uh, you know not getting access to treatment that they need and symptoms deteriorating. Do, do you see that often with with patients maybe that haven't gone the, down the genetics route or, um, you know, is are you are your patients interested in accessing genetics to ensure that they're on the right stuff? Or is there still a, kind of like a bit of a fear around it? But how does it feel? And particularly, I guess, you know, when you talk about your adult patients, you know, do they do they mind going back into Crumlin? Is this a you know something that they dislike, or how how does the system work? I guess when you are confronted with patients with adult patients. Yeah, so so uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of maybe um, we have a large uh, cohort of patients with PKU, phenylketonuria, and there is now a treatment that is a genotype specific treatment for um, patients with PKU. Um, and your candidacy for that treatment depends on the gene change that you have. So we have, um, and many of the patients that we had when this treatment came to be, but in our cohort here, never had the, the genetics done, let's say, um, because traditionally it would have been picked up a newborn screening by chemical diagnosis and, and, um, and would have been managed completely appropriately. Um, but now because we have a treatment that is, um, uh, I suppose, a genotype specific treatment, we open up that conversation when they come to clinic. And the vast majority of the patient cohort that we have um, have been very receptive towards having their, their genetic testing done. But we do it here. So um, we do it um, along with um, uh, the supports that we have, some of the supports that we have here, but it's because it's, it's pretty, I know, I mean, 
I'll use the word simplistic in a way, but it's one gene, so uh, it's not it's not super complicated, um, uh, and uh, we have the we have the ability to to do it here. Um, th there we there has definitely been occasions where um, patients with maybe uh, undiagnosed um, uh, that come with a constellation of symptoms, and we work them up, and we don't make a diagnosis, and we suggest well maybe going back to see the team in Crumlin would be a good idea. Like that has certainly happened as well. But I, I would say on the most part, the culture around um, getting involved with genetic testing uh, is now maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm a consultant five years, so I can't really compare it to what it was 25 years ago. But I would, I would say that it has shifted in a way and most people are very happy to engage in it once, um, once they have been really given a very, I suppose, uh, transparent and up-to-date counseling piece uh, and that's why the genetic counselor has been so important because the pre-test chat or the pre-test counseling piece is probably more important than the post-test counseling piece actually to prepare the patient um, for the eventualities and yeah. line them up and say well look if we do this these are what the scenarios that you're presented with are you happy to, to take these on board they may need to reflect on that and then decide whether they want to go ahead or not and if that's done really well, it makes the post-test piece, well, I, I knew that this was going to be the case, and then it's just a matter of following through with it. So the, the counselling piece is so crucial around this, uh, just so that people are fully informed of what they're getting into, let's say, and yeah. then uh, it, isn't, it isn't an issue. Yeah, 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 that, that's pleasing to hear. And for, and for people out there, just to, I guess, when we think, talk about genetic counselling. Genetic counselling is quite specific in terms of the realm or the, the word counselling is, is is quite different. You know, genetic counsellors are quite quite highly specific around the impact of getting, a, uh, I guess, a genetic diagnosis. Sarah, when you were uh, going through the process with Onya, I'm guessing that you didn't have that time to say, should we or shouldn't we? It was just, we're doing it. And, you know, have you had uh, access to, to genetic counselling and stuff since the diagnosis or have you just been on this, you know, hamster wheel, just go, 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 go? Have you, you know, have you had time to take breath yet, to draw breath? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. We kind of had no choice. It just, the ball started rolling and I still don't think it stopped. Um, for me, we've never gone down the route of genetic counselling. Um, there actually was a counsellor on the ward in Crumlin for the kids. Um, but because Anya was so young, I actually had a session with, with him every week. Um, so it was nice to talk to somebody and just get out there what I was feeling. And when I was having a bad day, he'd come in and we'd have a cup of tea and we'd have a chat. And yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but genetic counselling is actually something very interesting to me um, and something I definitely will look at because it's just as you said a totally different realm to normal everyday kind of counseling that you can receive um but no you're right we haven't the hamster wheel has not stopped yeah and there's still things that like i could be having a conversation with somebody and i'd say something and then it would twig with me oh my god i haven't even thought about that happening since it happened like that went into a box somewhere in the back of my head and it's been shut off and forgotten about until I just randomly came out of my mouth just now. And then you go down another rabbit hole of, oh, well, actually, Shakti really did go through a lot. And this conversation was had, and that conversation was had, and this decision had to be made. But like it wasn't this decision has to be made next week. It was this decision has to be made now. Um, and even when we were getting our shunt in, I definitely went into fight or flight mode. Um, and when we were get, when we were told we had to get our shunt in, I met her neurologist, um, neurosurgeon in Temple Street, and he said, "Yeah, so I think I think we might need a shunt." And I said, "Okay, when can you do it?" And he kind of looked at me and he was like, "Do you not want to go home and talk to your husband?" And like, this is a big thing. Like, this is a lifelong decision. Like, she is going to have this forever. And I went, "Yeah." I said, "What's your point? Like, let's do it." And he was like, "Do you not even want to consult your husband?" I picked up my phone and I rang him and I just said, Steve, are you on the same page as me? And he goes, does she need it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, yeah, we're all on the same page. Let's do it. So I hung up the phone and I said to, uh, to the neurosurgeon, so are we doing it yesterday or like tomorrow? 
so he was laughing at me he was like I wish all my patients were like you and it wasn't even a conscious decision for me it was a this has to be done so let's do it and I'll think about the after effects of it later on and anything that comes with it but we'll think about that when it arises right now we need to save my daughter's life so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a comment in here, I think a comment more than a question from, from Laura, and this is probably directed to you, James, but more, I think you've already answered it, where she said, you know, that she was kind of getting pushback uh, from from uh, healthcare providers to even get access to genetics. And that doesn't sound like uh, something that, that would be going on with you any any at this stage in yeah, well, it, it, I think it's a, there's just maybe a good point. And thanks, Laura, for that comment to bring out. So, so I, I, I'm a trained clinical geneticist, uh, and um, and the consultant group here uh, are many of them are trained clinical geneticists. So, we have, I suppose, t- t- we're lucky that we have that uh, that training uh, to do this in a in a an effective, efficient, but a safe way as well. And what's key here is that um, there is a general uplift of literacy across all professionals in Ireland uh, Mm -hmm. to handle genetic testing. And um, I see it was a neurology from somebody from neurology. So, um, you know, you know, what we're saying is that we we have very few professionals in Ireland, you know, the Crumlin be the center of of where most of them are located that have, you know, the training really to do this properly. And uh, if you approach a neurologist who maybe uh, doesn't have the the, the training or the background in genetics, they, they, they'll be reluctant to do it because of, of course, the ramifications of doing this and getting it wrong are huge. So we have to make sure that as we do this, we do this with the proper with the proper training, the proper background and, and so on. But of course, with the national, you know, there's a big shift now or big movement now to to upskill across the board at all levels. Uh, so you'll have consultants, but you will have genetic counselors. And then we have genetic research associates now coming on the GRAWS, GR, like, which I think is a very good name for them. Um, and, and, and also the specialists in cardiology and neurology, endocrinology to, 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 to learn the genomics of their area. And then they should be supported then behind with a the dyed in the wool, um, you know, clinical genetic services, um, yeah. because I'm, mainstreaming I'm is... to hear you say there, actually, Jim, you say that most of, of your your uh, uh, colleagues in, in metabolics are chain trained in this area. There must have been something happening in metabolics, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's like, right, we all need to upscale in this area was there a trigger well, or was there something no, so, well uh so just to frame it so metabolics is is biochemical genetics in north america just this part of the world they refer to it as metabolics so in north yeah. america all metabolic physicians are clinical geneticists okay uh, and the irish training scheme for clinical genetics uh allows for the trainees to develop into uh, metabolic physicians as well and um, my hat has to be tipped to Eileen Tracy who has since retired but she was very uh, influential around setting up the training scheme with Sally Ann Lynch and um, and ensure that we would have the possibility of of going into metabolics as well so so myself and Eileen Tracy um, are, are both clinical geneticists um, yeah. from the beginning but then subspecialized I suppose in metabolics as well mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, and all patients with an inherited metabolic disorder have a genetic disorder behind it yeah so it, it's just another it's just another name so 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 the two centers I suppose really like Crumlin being the main one and then you have uh, the metabolic physicians in the matter are uh, you know have been clinical genetics geneticists um, as well uh, now that's not I won't get into it too much, but it, it does, it does your train. You can come into metabolics for different ways, but that's one way in which you can come in. And that would be the traditional way in North America. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I'm going to bring one last question to Sarah, Nola, to Sarah, and then I'm going to uh, kind of like uh, wrap it up and refer back to some of what, what Jim has just said there. Sarah, I, I know uh, from previous conversations as part of this whole journey that you've been on with Onya, yourself and Stephen and, and, and the rest of the kids and Katie, her twin sister, um, you've 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 got an Instagram page for Onya's journey and and things like that. How have you found, I guess, 
support from people living with the, the same condition or support from people that are only getting diagnosed after you, you know, how are you, I'm like, I, I always find that the peer to peer piece for people living with rare diseases is incredibly important to them. Anybody that I speak to about it, they always say it's really, really helpful both the receiving of that support and also being able to pass on the information and give support to the next group coming through. Would, would you agree with that? Absolutely, 100%. When Anya was first diagnosed, as I've said to you in previous conversations, I searched high and low on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and any sort of social media I could think of. Um, and I did find an osteoporosis page on Facebook um, which was worldwide and there is a lot of members on it but I couldn't really find anything here um, or even in Europe so what I did was I set up an Instagram page for Anya called Anya's osteoporosis Anya's underscore osteoporosis journey um, and like that I it was like a daily diary I documented everything um, and if you've ever gone through it it's literally like day day minus 10 of transplant, day minus seven. Like we went through nearly every step of Anya's journey in it. Um, and now, we, even now, I still kind of update it every so often to, just to let people know uh, how she's getting on. But one of my, one of the greatest things for me about it was it was one post. It was one thing and anybody who wanted to know then could find out through that I wasn't having sent hundreds of messages every day I don't know if she had this condition today or she had this test today because people were really interested but we've had people come to us and say my child had this 10-15 years ago I could have written your story and um, just to let you know this is where we are I've had people come to us and say we've just been diagnosed um, listening to your story, or reading your story is actually really lovely. And can you answer this question or that question? No, what way did your country do this or whatever? Um, now, unfortunately, some of the families that have gotten through, to, uh, gotten in touch with me, their kids actually didn't make it, um, which obviously is very, very hard as well. But we've had all sides of the coin. Um, and like you said, the peer to peer is amazing because you can talk to people on the corridor in Crumlin and they'd have a completely different story to you and they just wouldn't like just like I wouldn't understand their story they wouldn't understand ours so having that peer-to-peer -peer of people who were either have gone through it or are going through it was a really really nice thing um, and my son always slags me that Anya has more followers than me on Instagram <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I get a lot of abuse in our house about that which is nice as well yeah um, don't, don't don't take it personally and don't absolutely it. not <laughs> so listen um like I guess um J James or Jim uh, referred there a little bit to to the new genomics resource associate and I guess the whole development of a genetics and genomics uh strategy for the country which is I guess it was launched last December and is beginning the process of being implemented uh, at this stage. But, you know, to, to deliver on that whole strategy, is going to be a five to 10 year, um, you know, time frame realistically. So the point of this campaign, our, our Get Rare Aware campaign, and in particular, uh, what we're asking people to do today is the Gen Genomics Resource Association would be somebody that that patients and families can link in with that can provide them with some support as they're going through the process. Um, Sarah had a or Sarah and Anya had a relatively quick process, six weeks, but for some people it takes six months or a year or two years or even longer. And so it's to provide a resource within Crumlin Genetics that can help people to get through that that I guess waiting game stage to explain to them where they are in the system and what's happening and to relieve some of the time of the consultants. So is that they're actually do doing, uh, I guess, what they've been trained to do and not having to dictate letters and write letters and all of those types of things. So what our campaign is specifically asking for is that we're asking for the government uh, to deliver on their promises in the programme for government. So when the last programme for government was put 
put, put in place uh, summer 2020. They specifically said that they will provide more support for Crumlin Genetics. And we're calling them on that now. We're saying, you've got to do this, guys. We know there's a new strategy, but that's going to be years in the delivery. And in the intervening period, we have lots of rare families that are waiting for a diagnosis and we need to do something to short circuit this. And I guess to build a really good foundation in Crumlin upon which a, a, you know, a comprehensive genetics and genomic service can actually be delivered. And so what we are asking you, the audience, to do is to get onto our Get Rare Aware website, getrareaware.ie, and to put in your names and your email addresses and to please make sure that you contact all of your local representatives in whatever area of the country that you're living in and ask them to put pressure on the government, say you've promised to do this in the programmes for government what are you doing now for Crumlin Genetics? And so that really is the stage that we're at now, guys. We've we this is as I say, it's our fourth meeting, and we've seen people, we've seen correspondence going in, and it is beginning to get traction. We're seeing, I guess, uh, requests being made of the Minister for Health to to deliver on this promise, and his responses are evolving as they're getting more and more of these requests, and we want to really put pressure on them to make sure that before the end of this year that there is something, a dedicated, uh, I guess, resource is put in place for Crumlin Genetics to help them to deal with the two year waiting list. Because I think, and we all think actually, even those in, in Crumlin Genetics feel that we should be able to get this down to at least a year and even lower. In the ideal scenario, we'd be looking for a six months uh, that everybody will be diagnosed within six months. Um, if, if there is a diagnosis available. Um, we know that for some people that won't be possible in terms of the science isn't there yet. But, you know, where there is a single gene involved, as, as Jim was talking about, and for some conditions, we should be turning that around super fast and getting the answers back out to people so that they can make sure that they're on the right diagnostic pathways, that they're on the right treatment pathways. Uh, so that's that's probably it in a nutshell. Everybody out there, please make sure that you spread the word. You tell everybody to get rare aware and join the campaign and contact your elected representatives. And so without further ado, I want to thank everybody and in particular to Jim for coming along. I know he probably has patients sitting outside waiting for him. And to Sarah, who I know has Onya in the background saying, where are you? I want my lunch now. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ricky.